Welcome back to Fresh Economic Thinking. Thank you all my paid subscribers for your support. This is the voiceover to the article entitled Are Australian Supermarkets the Bad Boys of the Economy? Question mark. <laughs> Here we go. This is all one take. Right now, there is a Senate inquiry into supermarket prices, as well as a much more extensive and detailed inquiry by the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the ACCC. Supermarkets aren't my highest priority in terms of the cost to consumers from their conduct. For example, superannuation is far more costly. See here and here, and there's some links to old articles there. But supermarkets nevertheless comprise a large share of household budgets and directly affect choices available in our daily lives. One dimension of supermarket competition revolves around location choices. Rules around these choices usually involve town planning regulations that seek to cluster retail activities in a hierarchy of locations. This article is about how town planning rules are used as the basis for often frivolous anti-competitive legal cases, and I go into some detail about a recent case in Brisbane. But the bigger puzzle is this. Why have supermarkets for so long behaved so anti-competitively compared to other retailers or commercial and industrial businesses? It might simply be the case that when there are a few ways to innovate your product, you innovate on other regulatory margins to outcompete your rivals. For example, see last week's Fresh Economic Thinking podcast about the electricity pseudo market. What else is a supermarket to do to make more money? This section's called A History of Taming Supermarket Behaviour. Look at what has already come out of the initial testimony to the current Senate inquiry on the topic of preventing competition through location choices. And I'm quoting from a news article here. The questions being put to Metcash CEO Grant Ramage during his session were mostly about land banking by Coles and Woolworths. In the context of supermarkets, land banking is a strategy where they buy up large areas of land across the country, even if they don't have plans or permission to build a store there, therefore reducing competition. Mr. Ramage was asked about this behaviour by Coles and Woolworths throughout his appearance before the committee, and he agrees that they are engaging in land banking. Senator Ross Cadell gave an example about land banking in the Hunter Valley in New South Wales, and Mr Ramage agreed that it was an example where supermarkets can buy buy a proxy through a developer, gain the centre and remove the independents. Senator Dean Smith followed up with more questions about land banking by the supermarket giants, and Mr Ramage responded that he didn't think it was overt or obvious. And I'm quoting from Mr. Ramage, It happens under the radar. There is no obligation for the majors to divulge when they acquire property. It's not illegal, Mr. Ramage says, adding they notify the ACCC and councils when they see it happening. End quote from that media article. But this is not the first time that supermarkets have been in the firing line for their anti-competitive conduct. It seems to be the nature of this industry. Brisbane-based property analyst Ross Elliott notes that a senior Westfield executive told him way back in the 1990s that, and I'm quoting from Ross, we would object to a competitor moving a pot plant if we thought it was in our interest to do so. End quote. In that 1990s era, we were equally concerned about such behaviour as we are today. Here's a 1999 review of retail trade practices by supermarkets, and there's a link there to the report. That report took the view that although there was a lot of consolidation in the sector, there were benefits from economies of scale to consumers. What is interesting to note from a quarter of a century in the future is that the market share of Coles and Woolworths hasn't changed as much as you would think. It's up from 55% to 65% depending on how you count it. But there is now no Franklin supermarket chain, and we have Aldi doing more than a third of the revenue of Coles today. Then, there was a 2002 grocery inquiry dealing with the behaviour of supermarkets in their contractual arrangements with suppliers. 
strangely, in 2003, there was a headline about the trolley wars. People were upset that Woolworths and Aldi were out-competing other grocery stores. This demonstrates that we don't know what we mean by competition. One company comes and out-competes another, and apparently that's uncompetitive. But you can't have competition without winners and losers. In the same year, the ACCC took action because of Woolworths' conduct around preventing liquor licenses from potential competitors. Then in 2004, Westfield's Frank Lowy tried to stop a supermarket on Brisbane Airport land near, near his Westfield Toomble shopping centre, as well as challenging a new shopping centre in Homebush in Sydney. This is a good line from an article at the time, and I'm quoting. The executive director of the Shopping Centre Council of Australia, Milton Cockburn, Coburn? Cockburn? disputes the allegations of anti-competitive tactics. Westfield is a prominent member of the council. He says, Lodging legal action is not anti-competitive. What law says you can't defend the interests of your investors and retailers? Perhaps Coburn should have a look at the National Competition Council's report on planning and construction laws, which begins, and I'm quoting, The major competition restriction in planning legislation is its potential to restrict the entry of new competitors in the market. This may result from the manipulation of the process by commercial objectors to create delays in decision-making and add significant additional costs for potential market entrants. End quote from that media article. In 2005, the ACCC intervened to stop attempts by Coles and Woolworths leveraging their power to influence the sales of independent grocery stores. Then, in 2008, the ACCC conducted an inquiry into the competitiveness of grocery retailers, out of which came an undertaking with Coles and Woolworths to phase out restrictive leases that prevented other supermarkets from leasing within the same shopping centre. I'm quoting from an article at the time here. During its grocery inquiry in 2008, the ACCC identified a practice where supermarket operators would include tenancy terms which may have presented shopping centre managers leasing space to other competing supermarkets. This had the potential to impose restrictions on the number of supermarket outlets in centres and consequently fewer options for consumers. Over 700 supermarket leases were identified through the ACCC investigation as potentially restrictive, and this agreement addresses all those existing leases involving Coles and Woolworths as well as dealing with all future arrangements. I welcome the cooperation of Coles and Woolworths in the development of this arrangement. The arrangement is in the form of a court-enforceable undertaking that has been voluntarily provided by Coles and Woolworths. End quote from that article. More interesting for me is this 2010 report by SGS Economics for the Commonwealth Treasury about the planning system as a barrier to entry for supermarkets and its comments that competition dimensions should not be a factor in planning decisions, i.e. you can approve supermarkets uh, any time you like without considering their effects on the customers of local supermar- other local supermarkets. Yet, at this time, courts were still busy with supermarkets trying to delay competition using planning appeals with frivolous legal cases. Uh, in 2012, there is a report, and I'm quoting, it says, Retail analysts say the result is that councils are lumbered with massive legal bills and shoppers face less choice and higher prices. More than 20 appeals against shopping centre and retail plans have been lodged in the Planning and Environment Court in the past two years. So that's uh, a quote about Queensland in 2012, after all those many years of inquiries. A 2009 undertaking by the supermarkets to remove those restrictive lease clauses, um, fixing a typo here, was positive for competition. But, (laughs) you might suspect, supermarkets were getting similarly effective outcomes with covenants on property when shopping centres were first developed. Here's how that works, and I'm quoting. There are a large amount of centres where we are restricted from entering because of covenants, said Aldi's Managing Director for Victoria, Tom Daunt. It can be an outright restriction on the use of land by a previous owner who might be a developer for a major supermarket. The other case is clauses in leases of major supermarkets with, which restrict competitors with quite dramatic rent reductions if a rival becomes a tenant in the same centre. Covenants on available land and clauses in leases 
They are all similar. They are all restrictions on trade. It is honestly quite something to see the frequency of these inquiries. I suspect that this behaviour is economically motivated in the same way that confusopolies emerge in undifferentiated industries like telephone, electricity, insurance and so forth. Because there are no technological technology margins to innovate, you push hard on regulatory margins instead. Of course, outside of the big two supermarkets, Aldi plays its own game, copying the colours and styles of food brands with its home brand labels. The other supermarkets have been upset about this, and I'm quoting from a, a, a media comment here. He pointed to similarities between some of Aldi's exclusive brands and national brands such as Bundaberg Ginger Beer, Procter & Gamble's Pantene Shampoo, General Mills, Old El Paso Taco Kits, and Kellogg's Special K. End quote. So, to wrap up this whirlwind history, supermarkets use their buying power to influence the actions of suppliers and shopping centre owners to prevent competition. Fine. But there are also some puzzles. For example, supermarkets defend their suppliers when it comes to protecting food brands from imitation, but then they also apparently squeeze these suppliers too. How do we reconcile this? Super shopping centre owners interf- interfere with new supermarket locations on behalf of supermarkets. It's a strange one. But I think it makes sense because new venues compete with all tenancies. And it's common to have turnover-based leases where landlords share in the turnover gains of tenants. Also puzzling is that Despite decades of concern about supermarket conduct and all these inquiries into what appear fairly aggressive tactics, grocery margins aren't super high, and the composition of players in the grocery market has changed quite a bit. There seem to be concerns when supermarkets act competitively, squeezing down prices from suppliers, and also when they act anti-competitively. I think a, a lot of the games we're playing here could benefit from clearer economic thinking on what competition really looks like. But the point I want to make today is to look closely at a recent case I'm aware of in Brisbane, where the landlord of a Woolworths at Newstead is challenging the planning approval of a a nearby shopping centre. This section's called A Brisbane Case of Supermarket Conduct. A new trend in Brisbane is the mixed-use retail residential and commercial precinct. One of the more successful and still yet to be completed projects of this type is in my neighbourhood called West Village, a cluster of eight towers, seven residential, one commercial, above a retail precinct with medical facilities and other uses. The model seems to work commercially, and with many large sites with existing low-density retail and industrial uses in Brisbane suburbs, there are now planning strategies and rules that accommodate this type of land, for example our suburban industrial strategy. Another example of this type of project is called Buranda Village on the site of a dated single-storey shopping centre, which is approved for seven towers, four residential with around 700 apartments and and another 10,000 square metres of retail. The flood-ravaged and under-demolition Toomble shopping centre is likely to get a similar treatment when redeveloped. But the project I want to talk about today is called Newstead Green on the site of a car yard in the booming inner-city suburb of Newstead. It is approved for nearly 800 apartments, a major retail, commercial showroom and lifestyle centre. But the owner of a nearby shopping centre with Woolworths as the anchor tenant, and that owner's AMP Capital, which is now owned by Dexas, they're appealing the decision. You can see the locations of the two sites below in, a, in this map. Notice in this map that there are purple, blue and green shading show all the new towers that have been proposed and the grey are the recently completed towers in that neighbourhood. This area is seriously developing. Thousands of new apartments are already approved, including this project. This seems enough local population to support an extra full-size supermarket which normally needs a catchment of around 5,000 people. To be clear, the Brisbane City Council is now defending its planning decision to approve the project against appeals by Dexas. The grounds of the appeal are, of course, many, and there's a link to the documentation, but this part really jumps out, and I'm going to quote from the appeal. It's a dot-point list. 1. 
The ep- economic impact of the proposed development upon Gasworks Plaza, that's the retail shopping centre where the Woolworths is, will be significant due to the scale of the pro- proposed retail component, component, its proximity to Gasworks Plaza, and the extent of the proposed development's trade area. Two, the retail component of the proposed development se- seeks to replicate Gasworks Plaza, which, given its close pro- proximity, will provide no community benefit in terms of convenience or choice. That's a weird one. Three, these impacts will seriously erode the viability and vitality of the retail tenancies at Gasworks Plaza, thereby compromising the function of Gasworks Plaza. Four, centres provide a focus for public and private investment and community activity. Considerable investment has been made to provide infrastructure, buildings and businesses both within Gasworks Plaza and the adjoining area. This creates a vitality which is central to its function. By diluting economic activity to another location, direct economic impacts will be significant and the benefits intended by the city plan will be eroded to the detriment of public interest. And five, the impact of the proposed development on Gasworks Plaza would exceed 15% of sales. 15, 1,5%. So that's their argument in the document. And I think the last point gets to the heart of it. I doubt there will be a 15% effect on the trade from today, especially considering the growth of the neighbourhood that will go along with the project of this scale. They are literally saying that a new centre will compete for customers and that they don't like it. Since we know that competition is not a valid argument in planning, this probably won't fly. The case will just cost time and money and the resources of the courts. But now to the original question of the supermarket bad boys. If there was no supermarket here in Newstead Green, but still plenty of retail space, the owner of a nearby shopping centre is unlikely to engage in this type of anti-competitive legal strategy. If it was a new commercial building, owners of nearby nearby buildings wouldn't take these anti-competitive actions. If it was a new industrial project, again, the same. Only supermarkets seem to be this actively engaged in anti-competitive behaviour in all domains, especially around real estate, lease conditions, which were stamped out by the ACCC, but covenants still around, planning and zoning, contract conditions with suppliers, and other regulations. Why? Maybe it happens in the shadows, more so in other sectors, but, but does it? Or are supermarkets just the bad boy because they have no other innovation to offer to increase their profits. I'll leave it there for today. Thanks for your support and thanks for listening.